All right, so this Precision Canola project is really cool. Uh, we've been working on this for, for quite a few years. I remember one of the first years, maybe five or six years ago, I was here. We did a big demo with Ag Canada and uh, the Australians were really interested in it. So we took uh, basically the same monosem planter that uh, we talked about this morning and did some demo plots and compared that to ours and tried to get the ultra low seeding rates just, just to show that canopy architecture and closure. And uh, the, the project itself has kind of bloomed from there. Uh, we we uh, did, did one year of the, the corn project and uh, we really like to double up on our efficiencies and, and show some of the neat stuff we can do. And, and maybe because producers have been moving towards this, we really wanted to put a, a project together detailing kind of the, the key components of a precision planner. So we have two aspects to this study. The first one we'll talk about is, is the FOSS levels. And what happens with the FOSS levels, I mean, what's, what's the least concentrated way to put down, say, 20 pounds per acre of FOSS? and broadcast it, spread it out as much as you can. And when you plant, plant your crop, it's gonna be the least concentrated. So now we've got uh, our precision planter. We did it 12, uh, 12 inch row spacing and 20 inch row spacing. And our standard air drill is nine and a half. So kind of as close as we could get to the 12, we try to get them as close together as we could. So what happens is you, you take a band and you go from nine inches to 20 inches you basically double the concentration of your seed place FOSS. So one of the big issues we were concerned about was uh, the seedling safety. So, uh, you know, from, from our research perspective, we've tended to, to go on the higher end. We'll go 30 pounds or 35 pounds of actual P205 with our seed. And 95% of the time, we don't have much of an issue. Um, that's mostly because of good moisture and, and good seed uh, seeding timing, kind of that first second week of May uh, but but we were definitely concerned going on to the 12 and especially 20 inch rows with the with the monosem planter how high we could go and still have decent seedling safety so we we did the first year 0 5 10 20 and I think 40 pounds per acre or kgs per hectare I think in our case of actual p205 and and we didn't see any issues the whole, the whole first year. So I think we upped it to the signs say 80, but I think we could only get 60 out of our actual equipment because we used the, the liquid 10340. So Ken grabbed a couple of plants and I think it's, it's pretty neat to see. I, it, we were hoping to see a, a seed safety effect. We were hoping to see at the really high end, especially on the wide rows that we just kind of nuked our plots or we had bad germ or bad emergence or something. And, we haven't quite plugged through that data to see if maybe there was a reduced stand or some of the, the heights or canopies to see if it was delaying things. But I think what we ended up seeing was a, a fertility response to the actual phosphorus we put down with our canola. Is that, is that what you have in the plants yeah. there? Like when we're sitting up here looking at the plots, you can hardly tell that there's a difference. But as we went from zero all the way up to 60 pounds of actual phosphorus with the seed, look at the difference in, in plant architecture. I'm guessing you can guess which one's which. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So this is supposed to be a toxic level, this, this rate. Anybody know what the recommended phosphorus seed place rate is with canola? In the canola council? Yeah, somewhere around there. 15, it's even less. As, you know, that was the big issue with when you go to a 20 inch row spacing, they're saying that it was five. Yeah. We, would, we did 60. Well, this the, the two plants that I pulled were the, the 12 inch row spacing, but even on our 20 inch rows, for two years running, we haven't seen any issues. That doesn't mean that I'd recommend you push it, but pretty amazing response to the two different products here. This canola out here in Medicine Hat looks absolutely fantastic this year. It doesn't always look like this, but um, something to consider. I know that uh, the IPNI is always talking about phosphorus is becoming a bigger issue with deficiencies because we're just not using it and we think we're not seeing a response i think that's a response yeah what was the soil test boss in here it's low definitely low yeah i think we're, we're usually deficient in foss 10 5 10 and then in even a little bit of sulfur which we we didn't test in this this case but the the fertility around here isn't isn't all that high and it's a lot sandier soiled in than compared to lethbridge as well um, I was, I was going to say, yeah, until, until the year we started this project. 
Twenty. That's zero. Oh, yeah, zero and zero and a forty, right? Yeah, it definitely impacts maturity as well, like Rob just mentioned. You can see that in flowering densities <laughs> along the plots. I think I got bit here. <laughs> Wasps. Yeah. So I guess to explain the trial a little better, the first chunk of five plots is what were those? The twelves. The 12 inch that we drove by, and then they go up in increasing order, the 0, 5, 10, 20. Uh, but you'll see as, as we keep going by. Then we went to the 22 inch. So one of the things that we've noticed on, well, maybe I'll talk about in the seed rate because that makes a little more sense over there. But yeah, it's going to definitely be interesting. One, one of the weird things too is that uh, the first, I don't know, maybe five of the last six years, we've had a lot better yield in our Lethbridge dryland sites. And then just because of the weather conditions the last two years, I don't think our, our Lethbridge dryland doesn't look quite like this at all. You can still see down some of the rows on the wider spacing and see the ground. So we're taking, uh, you know, because we talked about that longest day of the year and the solstice effect, we've been taking uh, crop canopy photos on kind of on a semi-weekly basis as well as some UAV. So we're gonna, hopefully put that through a couple computer programs and try and figure out our actual uh, canopy closure and then uh, look at some of the flowering dates and kind of the visual assessments and see whether or not we can actually quantify that to the to the actual kind of yield yield benefit from some of these crops so which so one on is that the 22 from? inch row spacing which one looks better so this is the 40 pounds kgs per hectare of phosphorus and this is 60 so we did reach an injury level nice on the 60. that's that's good we were hoping usually when we're trying to set up our treatments we want at the high end to make sure we hit that injury level and i think that's why the first year we did it we just really didn't see it so we had to add in basically added another treatment yeah, we put in. another rate in yeah. so like you said this is 1034 yeah. 1034 yeah yeah and it was put it put down uh in our both our, our air seeder and with the mono semi to put right down with the seed row just basically I think in the air seeder it goes right in a drop tube right behind the seed as it goes down before the furrow closes and then that mono sem it's basically the same thing. Yeah. One of one of the challenges for that mono sem was we had somebody out here with a wheel who just sat here like this spinning the wheel every time we wanted to go down into a plot because they had to get the whole system primed. So kind of like he was talking about before having those big plots it makes things a, a little easier for this kind of research and because because of the setup on that system it's hard to just run a serpentine and keep everything randomized so we ended up seeding both seeders at the exact same time here we've got some cool shots and you know we'd, we'd be seeding one shot one rate with the air seeder and they'd do one plot with the air drill and we could do four plots one for each rep and then we'd have to come back to base here and set things up and change our sprockets or change the zero max settings and start over again. So we spent basically an entire day just seeding this trial and this trial, whereas with the mustard, we seeded one, two, eight or nine trials in less than a day. So a lot, a lot of extra work went into all that side of things. Is there any questions on the FOSS before we kind of jump over to the, to the next little bit? How much, I'm going to pick on Andy a bit because I know he's doing precision planter stuff. How much are you putting down with yours? Uh, five gallons of Alpine, which is, what's that, Gary, 14 pounds? Five gallons, about times three, I think. Yeah. And are you, are you topping up extra after or do you have high background? I'm putting granular in a band four inches off the row. Okay. Uh, another, what is that, another 20 pounds, I think. Yeah. Went, uh, so with so 35 is kind of that that rate. And do you do it with the the mono sem after, or how do you do that? Because ours we'd have to come back in with a different seeder or system to do yeah, that. Yeah, no, I put like I put uh, I put granular 1152 with the with the granular blend down um, with my planter. My planter has banders on it. Oh, okay. I yeah. And, and and ours has I think it's set up for mid row banding. Mm -hmm. So we put the end up ahead in side the mid row. Side well side it is side band, not mid row band. So I guess it'd be the same. You could come up with a blend yeah, and do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this seeding rate trial, what we did was we set it up with the, the air drill and the mono sem exactly the same way. Those ones were all seeded at 100 seeds per meter squared. Uh, this trial, we, we have our air drill at nine and a half inches and we seeded uh, 
did those bags make it out here with the canola? That's okay if they're, they're not. We, we've got 20 seeds per meter squared, which is about 0.7 pounds an acre, just under a pound an acre. And then we go 40, 60, 80, and 160. So well above kind of the recommended rate. And we did the exact same thing with the air drill at 12 inch and the air drill at 20 inches. So we can, what we can do is kind of just drive along to the end and you'll see we, so we start here with 20, 40, 60, 80. And I, I think you get kind of a good, a good feel for how the canopy closure worked. These ones were at 12 inch, inch spacing, but you can see there's, even with uh, the nice seed placement and spacing, there's still some pretty big gaps because we're at such a low seeding rate. Um, and unfortunately, because we had to seed it in such a, a crazy, in a crazy method, on some of the wider spacings, you'll see the same thing that happened with the corn where our outside rows had a little bit of compaction. So we're hoping to harvest the middle and kind of ignore that. But it's, it looks pretty neat to go by. Um, one of the biggest things we've seen for sure is that, is that canopy closure. And I think the wide rows are just not gonna close over fully. There's always gonna be a bit. And, and who knows, that, that may just mean that some of those plants may get some more sun as it comes in this way as opposed to if there's too many plants crowded together. I'm not sure entirely how that all works, but it's gonna be interesting to, to piece some of that together. Um, I guess some of the interesting results that we found uh, the first year that we did this here was I think, I think our, our rate about 40 or 60 seeds per meter squared, even out in, in Mad Hat here, we had really nice moisture. We had pretty sufficient dry land uh, yields and I think, I think our 60 seeds per meter squared was kind of the, the benchmark for, for all three drills combined. Um, but on our, our 12 inch spacing with the monosem, that was our highest yielding uh, overall. And uh, the air drill didn't do as well as anything else. So we, we changed it up a little bit. We, we had some difficulties actually getting to the ultra low seeding rates with our air drill last year, just because who would seed a half a pound an acre with an air drill. So we ended up having to make some modifications to the sprockets and uh, change up some of the gearing so that we could hit lower rates. And hopefully it'll be a little more consistent. I think when, with, our, with our cone system that we did before, the, the plots ended up a little patchier. Um, and you could just see they were a lot patchier. And I think this year there's a lot more uniform coverage. And uh, so it will we'll be interesting to see what happens and whether or not those trends continue. But uh, on the irrigated side of things, back in Lethbridge, we hit, we hit max yield at like the 20 seeds per meter squared and the plots looked incredible. You know, it's growing under irrigation, under perfect conditions. And, you know, I think, I think up at the, the 40 was okay. And then it, it almost, the yields almost started to decline after, before we even hit kind of that five pounds an acre old benchmark of, of seeding rate. So, yes, am I missing anything? Anybody else doing uh, precision planting of canola? Yeah, we did some this year. Yeah, and, and what spacing are you using? Oh, I, I got a 30 inch planter, but we doubled back. So it's basically 15 inch, but I was direct seeding into corn rows. Yeah. So I had to move away a little bit. So it's actually more like 12 inches and 18 inches apart. Oh, okay. So you kind of kind of staggered back and forth. Twi yeah. yeah. But that, that sure protected the canola from the wind because my neighbor was just two miles away. It was. Like sure very off. conventional, lots of tillage, and uh, yeah, he lost a lot of canola. So you've got a lot of standing corn stubble that you see yeah. into, and kind of went into row. Oh wow, RTK, I take it. <coughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that's awesome. And have you done it before? No. You, no. No. I think I think one of the challenges that I've heard from a lot of producers is is kind of more on the equipment and the maintenance, and they love seeding with with that, and they think their yields are better, but then in the shop they're they're changing equipment over and they're replacing those discs or other pieces, the springs or whatever else on the equipment a little more frequently. And I think they have a lot, a lot more shop hours involved in ma maintaining a, a standard air drill. How, how big are you guys using for equipment? Like I, I know ours is pretty much as small as you can get. Well, mine's 12 row on the canola, but eight feet on the corner at some point. 12, 12 row. So not, not a hundred feet by any means. <laughs> Does it take a whole lot longer to seed? For your trials? Well, doubling back, well, doubling back was painful. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've already seeded it once? So why, what else have you mentioned? Why do you think, what's one of the big, like we talked about this in corn, what's the benefit of doing a better job with the precision planter? Andy? 
What's the benefit of doing a better job? Uh, I really noticed emergence was within a day. Yeah, it yeah. It all came up at the same time. That's, that's one thing I'm particularly interested in too. In fact, at the field school this year, I did some, some wheat demos. Uh, not too many people are using a precision planter for wheat, but we've got this nasty problem that Mike's going to talk about. We've got the Mike squared going on this afternoon, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, Fusarium head blight and, and ergot are both crops that are vulnerable at the flowering stage. So there's two things we can do as far as equipment management side of things. It's seeding rate and even emergence. So if the, the, the premise there is if we couple an appropriate seeding rate and, then, and of course with a, a resistant variety and we can get our, our wheat crops to flower within you know a week and a half or a week or something like that as opposed to two or three weeks then we're essentially minimizing our risk to to fusarium so that's that's one thing that i'd like to study down the road is is how can we do a better job with with tiller management and uh emergence and evenness of flowering and, and decreasing our overall flower time to help with that uh, that nasty fusarium problem and the, the other end of that same wheat trial obviously you'd, you'd have to go back and double seed those i think to keep the the row spacing manageable but the tillering that that we pulled out uh, you could see a huge huge effect on the tillering from the you know a standard 300 seeds per meter squared getting down to 50 seeds a meter squared i mean the the plants were just ballooning out like some of the the forages and the so, you know, you have a single wheat stem almost coming up at the high rates because they're so concentrated in that row, so. And then in canola, that, that even emergence is really nice so that you have even flowering throughout the season. Again, um, probably biggest concern is, is green seed management. So if yeah. you can have everything come to maturity at the same time and be able to, you know, improve the harvestability and, and manage green seed, I think there's a benefit there. The biggest value that I think is, is, is interesting within the canola side of things is what do you guys think is the average survival of canola that we're seeding right now? Standard rates, all your farmers and, and people. Yeah, it's 50 to 60. 60. 50 I hear, Andy's optimistic. 20 to 80? <laughs> 20 to 80, well, that's, that's, to that's true. I that's think. what yeah. this survival is like. Is like. Yeah, I, I'd bet that on average we're in that 40 to 50% range. and. Um, that's a bit of a tough pill to swallow with that expensive hybrid seed. Uh, I don't think that I'd, uh, I'd use the seeding rate, um, this, the cost to seed as a driver. I'm more interested in the other positive agronomic benefits. But when we got down uh, to our, our 40 uh, seeds per meter squared, our, our percent emergent went as, or as high as 75%. So we went from that sort of average of 50 to 75, which I think is is pretty significant but then again it comes down to risk management as well so you have to sort of couple uh, your seeding equipment the conditions that you're under um, you don't want to get too low because then all of a sudden when any other stress comes in you're gonna not gonna have the stand to to, to, to deal with it so um, I don't know if you heard but there's a storm brewing and we're gonna do some hailing later a, a nice I, I can notice that with that hail machine a heavy stand versus a light stand. I have to go over it 10 times with the machine to beat it down versus uh, a, a good heavy crop. And that's the same thing with any stress. It's it's uh, if you have bugs come in. So you wanna have that optimum stand. What do you guys know what the optimal or uh, recommended stand is now from the Canola Council? They just changed it this year. Did anyone know what it used to be? Seven to 10. Seven to 10, 10 was the old recommendation. So the council and Murray Hartman in particular put all of the data they could together as far as emergence uh, is concerned and actually reduced the recommendation down to four to six. Yeah, four to six. So Maybe pretty even... dramatic uh, recommendation. They knew that farmers weren't doing it anyways um, and, and, and being quite successful. So they just, uh, they had the data to confirm that. So, so four to six plants is, um, is now recommended. When we're down at our low seeding rates with the planter, we're at about two, two and a half. So we're half of the canola recommendation and still doing well. Yeah. But again, think of that risk management side of things. So, well, I think part of the part of the reason for the for the change too was all the all that old data was taken from the OP varieties, and now we've moved into all the hybrid systems. So they figure the vigor and the 
the the emergence and growth was was a lot better with some of these new varieties so that was that was part of the reason they wanted to go back and and kind of reinvestigate that that curve that they had and then on i guess on on this trial in particular too uh in terms of that emergence we we did see a pretty dramatic increase in emergence just kind of averaged across the seeding rates i think it was almost 38 or 35%, something percent 35 percent yeah. better on our 12 inch rows with that monosem compared to the air drill and then about still 10 or 12 percent better i think with the with the 20 inch spacing although there was a, a couple of nuances there but kind of overall that's what we saw and we'll see what happens like i said this year with some I of think the it'll be a little different made. this year but last year the results yeah. were pretty exciting in the fact that when we did the 12 inch monosem our yields peaked at at that low seeding rate yeah it was a flat curve and we had uh, a 20% yield improvement over the air drill. We almost, we almost, no, I, wouldn't, yeah. I, don't, I don't like to get too excited. It's too good to be true. It usually yeah. isn't. And, um, this year, I think, is a, is a slightly different year. But the 20-inch the row spacing was on par with our, our pillar laser opener. So, you know, that's another thing to consider. Lots of people are going to go straight to these 20, 22-inch row spacing simply because that's the equipment they have with their row crops. I think that um, on a dry land condition, we're not really getting the canopy closure at that, that row spacing. And I, I like that 15 to 12 inch range so far. Yeah, we, we did a bunch of that UAV work and, and pictures. And when we, we went literally seated same day dry land and irrigated across the street. And you know, the irrigated, you couldn't even hardly tell the difference between the treatments because they were just flowering and blooming and looking great. And our dry land was, you know, looked like half of this plot and hardly flowering and you could like walk, walk between the rows and it was pretty dramatic. So I think that'll have big implications too, just whether or not you're, you're an irrigated canola farmer or if you're, you're farming dry land as well. I'll, I'll just, hail. um, did you want me to drag them by the plots? Just to sure. Yeah. You can kind of see. You walk by them. They're, they're actually... By here, you can already tell how much thicker the stand is. It's 60. And I mean, you don't see a whole lot of difference by the time you hit 60, 80, and 160. Other than the fact that this one's maybe even starting to look crowded and, and the plants themselves don't have that nice branching anymore. These are 20s and this one, believe it or not, is a 20 seeds per meter squared. And it doesn't look too, too bad. We go 40. 60, 80, and 160. But you can still see as you go by, there's even at the highest rate, there's still kind of almost a little row you can see down. And because they're so far apart, you can walk through, I think, fairly easily. And then our air drill, I think, looks the most kind of sporadic, especially at this lower rate. You know, I can almost guarantee this one's probably going to be the lowest yielding and I don't think it looks good until you get up maybe up around this 80 or even 160 looks pretty pretty good from the air drill but it's got that benefit of being kind of random and, and spread out a little better because we were seeding so crazy and going all over the place we forgot to put our guard row in here it's just a walkway Maybe just to clarify, we're talking about so many seeds per square meter. Seeds per square meter, yeah. The other number you're quoting was so many plants per square foot, right? So yeah. Just, just so everybody on the wagon knows. Yeah. We're sort of talking a little bit of apples and oranges there. On those yeah, I'm sure this is this has got to be like eight or ten plants a square foot, I think, if not. Well, it's yeah, you that, times like 11, so 16. Close. 16 plants per square foot, basically, yeah. 15 or 16. We understand the square foot thing, but we really don't understand the kilograms per hectare. Okay, well, it's pounds per acre isn't all that different. It's, it's very. It's close. it's almost. It's one point one is the one point one three all. Yeah. 